Any time spent studying the scriptures for information on how we are to conduct ourselves in our assigned roles in our families, I believe is time that is very well spent. And tonight's topic has to do with preparation for marriage. There are as many topics on the family as we have imagination to, to discuss, but there are many facets of our relationships. I do believe the purpose and object of a topic such as this is to help improve the odds of success in our marriages. And if so, I certainly agree with that goal and think it is most appropriate for God's people. Sometimes we naively think if we are a Christian and we marry someone who is a Christian, everything will be great and we will live happily ever after. Sadly, that is not the case. There is no guarantee of a successful marriage if both are Christians or even if both have been raised in the church. Neither, of course, is there a guarantee of an unsuccessful marriage, but we don't automatically just have successful relationships because either spouse in a marriage can make decisions that forever alters the success of the marriage and can mar what God intends. You see, voluntarily, every day, we decide who we're going to be as an individual and as a spouse. And so, some days we make really poor choices. Some days we make great choices. But on that kind of happy note, let's start. Everybody wants to be married, right? Most presume that marriage is what everybody wants to do when we grow up, but that would not necessarily be correct in our culture today. In fact, Erica Smith writing says today only half of American adults are married compared with 72% in 1960. The marriage decline has happened slowly but steadily with marriage rates dropping eight points between 1990 and 2019. Those who do get married are tying the knot later. The average age for first marriage is 28 for women and 30 for men compared to 20 for women and 23 for men in 1960. That is a huge change and it has had so many effects on our nation and on our culture. This does not mean that individuals have been abstinent in this time, but it does mean that individuals living together immorally are numbered in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions across our country and around the world. Same-sex weddings are on the rise. An increasing number of Americans are simply opting out of marriage altogether. Smith continues to say, marriage was once considered the most legitimate way to be in a relationship, to have sex and to have a family. And though there are communities where that still applies, this was written in 2019, it's increasingly no longer the case. It's become more common to live with a partner and to have children without marriage. Women have become increasingly financially independent. Divorce has become easier and less stigmatized. And the price of weddings has skyrocketed. And in 2019, for many, marriage is not a priority or even something they want at all. There's been a social change and a culture change. Marriage is still important, one says. It hasn't gone away. But now there are other legitimate ways to make families and to be in relationships. Well, as God's people, we are not supposed to be influenced by the gods of the nations around us. But like Israel of old, we are. Hosea 3 verse 1, speaking of the children of Israel, talks about those who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. And that is simply what we do many times. We love the raisin cakes of the pagans as far as relationships are concerned. And it is extremely detrimental to the spiritual strength and success of our families and thus it affects the church. Now we do know that there are many relationship scriptures including in them Ephesians chapter 5 that we could camp out on and spend years studying in, in vivid detail. But the concept there is a comparison of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church, and husband and wife. Husbands are commanded, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. What an amazing example for we men to follow. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Well, we are reminded that the sacrifice of Christ for his bride, the church, was carefully planned from the foundation of the world. It did not just happen by accident. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 20, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. The church was carefully, carefully planned. 
And I would hope, since our earthly marriages are compared to the spiritual relationship of Christ with the church, we would likewise think and conclude logically, our marriages need to be carefully planned. Since we are to be the earthly image between husband and wife of the spiritual relationship that exists between Christ and the church, we want the world to see Christ and his bride, the church, when the world sees our relationships as husband and wife. Now, most of us do get married. This particular chart says that by 75 years old, most of us do get married at least once. In fact, uh, some 96% of us do get married at least once by the time we are 75 years old. Now, if 96% of us do get married by that time, that means that 4% of us don't. 4% of us in our culture never do get married. And it's not a sin to remain unmarried. It's not sinful at all. There is no command that says we must get married. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about a married relationship versus an unmarried relationship. And he who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. It's kind of a shock when we first see this passage and see that being married is compared to a thing of the world, which usually indicates sin. But that is not the case in this particular passage at all. What it does mean is that there is a change in focus for our priority as individuals. When we are unmarried, our priority can be with who we are in our relationship to God. When we marry, our relationship with God is also just as important, but now it begins not vertically but horizontally. We prove our love and our service to God by how we are as a spouse in our homes. And I, perhaps like you, have seen individuals who love the Lord but hate their spouse. And they want to do everything in the world for the church. Let me do this. Let me study with your young people. But I hate my spouse. Don't ask me to be happy at home. Don't ask me to pretend I love this person that I'm married to. But I'm going to help all the young people. Like, no. Brother, sister, go home. Be quiet. Learn to serve. Learn to humble yourself. Because when we are married, our focus begins with the person we are married to. And if we're not ready to make that commitment, please do not be influencing others to follow in your footsteps. Once we marry, God is still our most important priority in life. But the way we prove that every day is first by the way we treat our spouse. Okay, when do we prepare for marriage? When we look at preparation for marriage, most of the time, we have in mind that brief interval of time between engagement and ceremony when individuals may have special studies on this topic to help them be better prepared to be a husband or a wife. I would submit that awareness of the need for preparation for marriage is supposed to be in long before an engagement occurs and a wedding date is set. As one who studies with individuals before they marry, it has happened quite a few times through the decades where somebody calls and says, we want to study with you. Great, when's the wedding? Next week. Oh, that doesn't work with me. Sorry, I'm a lot slower than that. Takes, takes, but, but anyway, there is an anticipation sometimes of a need, but not necessarily an understanding of the commitment that is involved. Questions that I think we can ask ourselves prior to engagement and marriage is, including all of these, if I am to marry, what do I bring to the marriage? Not in the form of a dowry that can be measured as a degree of wealth in money or possessions, although some cultures still practice that. I'm speaking of things like, what life gifts do I possess to present to a spouse to help make our lives together better than our lives would be if lived separately? What am I truly bringing to the relationship that I'm about to be in. And as an example, I believe that these life gifts can include things like appropriate values, maturity, self-control, and commitment to God. I believe that those would be wonderful gifts for someone to bring to a marriage. You see, these gifts are in keeping with verses like Titus chapter 2, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There are many passages that we could go to that have these concepts. I have just picked out a few to use in the talk here tonight. But the broader picture that is in Titus chapter 2 
is of Paul telling Titus as an evangelist, here's who you need to be. Here's what you need to do. Speak the things that are proper for sound doctrine. Paul is saying to Titus as a preacher, you have to behave yourself. You have to practice what you preach. And you have to be known as someone who is worthy of respect because you, you have a priority in your life to serve the Lord. And then, Titus, as an evangelist, you also need to teach others. And this teaching that Titus is charged to do is called sound doctrine. Those things that are proper for sound doctrine. It is sound doctrine for preachers of the gospel and leaders of congregations to tell individuals how they need to be in their lives. Sometimes we get to thinking it's nobody's business how I live. As long as I show up on Sunday morning and don't cause too much trouble, you can't ask me who I am and what I do. That is not sound doctrine. There are specific things that older men, older women, young women, and young men are to follow in their lives and to exemplify in their lives. Now, every one of us are addressed in this. Every one of us. Therefore, in verses 1 through 10 of Titus 2, Paul's inspired instruction to Titus is for who he, who he was to be personally. He was to point fingers at himself personally, how he was to be very careful. And then he was to practice sound doctrine in instructing others how they were to live. And verses 11 and 12 is then a summary of all that Paul has said and can also, I believe, be applied to us. Verses 11 and 12 of Titus 2, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Wayne Fussell, writing in the Contending for the Faith commentary on Titus 2, says the little word for reaches back to everything said in the first ten verses of Titus 2. What follows forms the ground for all that has been said, and Alfred says that the word for expresses reasons for the above exhortations. Linsky on verse 12, having denied the ungodliness and the worldly lusts means that by a divine act we broke with them, disowned and ousted them as being abominable. Now, Linsky, writing as a Lutheran, did believe uh, the, uh, the inherited sin. And we know that this is not a miraculous thing that happens. This is our will, according to our belief and faith in the Word of God and our obedience to it, that breaks with those sinful things of the past. Linsky continues, when it is viewed in detail, the ungodliness consists of worldly lusts, at least manifests itself in them, and worldly means that the desires are connected only with life in this cosmos and seek their satisfaction in nothing higher those two terms sum up the whole inwardness of man in his sinful state. And we all can be in that state, and we have been before Jesus. In Titus chapter 2, verse 12, certain things are to be denied by individuals. And if you want to find something that's wrong to say in our politically correct environment today, just try telling somebody something's wrong. And you, you just won't get very far. Now, try telling somebody, oh, go into a department store and just steal a bunch of stuff. Try telling somebody that does that that that's wrong. And they'll say, no, no, that's the, that's the woke thing to do. It's like, you're kidding me. Certain things, though, are to be denied. Who's to do the denying? We are as individuals. What are we supposed to deny? Whatever is un ungodliness and whatever is worldly lust. This is just like our brethren at Corinth. Our brothers and sisters at Corinth had practiced many sinful lifestyles. And Paul was able to say to them, and such were some of you. But when they obeyed the gospel and repented, they had to put those things away. Not that they ceased to be tempted to follow those lifestyles, but they had to be willing to say no to the ungodliness that they had lived before. Well, instead of only seeking fulfillment of things of this life, we who are Christians are to repent of wrong choices, turn our backs on all ungodliness and worldly lusts, which can be included in the concept of darkness. We are to be out of darkness. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Instead, we are to practice living to please God, presenting ourselves to Him. And we are to do this according to our ability to reason. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. This is not an emotional exercise that says, Oh, I surrender, I'm going to serve the Lord. This is a logical exercise where faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we reason according to our intellect that it is the right logical thing to do for us to serve the Lord according to his commandments. So this is a positive concept that is to be a way of life. Who is supposed to live this way? All of us. How are we supposed to live, as the verse says, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world? Clark has some amazing comments on this. 
And he observed that these three words evidently include our duty to God, to our neighbor, and to ourselves. We are to live soberly in respect to ourselves, righteously in respect to our neighbor, and godly or piously in respect uh, to our neighbor, and godly or piously in respect to our maker. On, on the phrase, in this present world, Clark says, not supposing that anything will be purified in the world to come that is not cleansed in this. Now that's a statement that just causes me to sit and look at it for a while because the concept is when we are deliberately practicing ungodliness somehow we think that that won't matter to God but as Clark says not supposing that anything purified in the world to come is not that is not cleansed in this so we need to put those things behind us Bengal says soberly righteously and godly the three cardinal virtues from which either single or united all others spring so, if we are to be children of light, that means we come out of darkness, we walk as the children of light, it's a habitual, regular, everyday thing that we intend to do every day in every possible way. Whether or not we marry, that's who we're supposed to be. So you might say that preparation for life can also be viewed as preparation for marriage. Whether or not we marry, hopefully we will have these attributes in our lives because the pursuit of walking in the light, of avoiding ungodliness and worldly lusts and choosing instead to live soberly, righteously, and godly is not a one-time event. It is a lifelong commitment to a way of life that must be renewed every day lest we get off course on our journey to heaven, whether or not we marry. So there needs to be some practical applications of these spiritual concepts. How can we live soberly, righteously, and godly? Here are some examples. We can resolve to live soberly, righteously, and godly financially, physically, domestically, emotionally, and spiritually. And again, I'm sure there would be many, many more. These are just those that I've selected for our talk tonight. Financially, an appropriate relationship with money is essential for individuals and for a marriage. Money is to be a means, not a master, because the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. We're to observe wise financial management as God's people, because we have more to do than just spend the money we earn on ourselves. We have the Lord's work to consider, and we have our own personal charitable giving, charitable giving to consider. And we each are to be willing to work to provide for ourselves and for our families. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, if we are of the 96% that get married and the other person is taking care of us financially, we may not need to worry too much about this. But what if we are the 4%, whether male or female? We need to know how we're going to provide for ourselves. And it doesn't work to say, my parents will provide for me because I'm going to live to be 100 and they're going to live to be 130. Doesn't work that way. Sorry. Doesn't work that way at all. Living soberly, righteously, and godly physically has to do with how we are with the behavior of the flesh, if you will. Our bodies are for God's glory. The temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. And we are to nourish and cherish ourselves as the Lord the church, and that is the general rule in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 29. The general rule for every one of us. No one hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And that would indicate a need for acceptance, contentment, and thankfulness for who we are physically. Now, oh, this can be a tough area. Because some of us are a little more fluffy than we would like to be. Uh, some of us are not as fluffy as we would like, not as fluffy as we'd like to be. And I'm always amazed. Sometimes I run across people who say, I just can't gain weight. And I usually very sincerely say, oh, what a problem you have. I can't begin to say how sorry I am that you have. No, it's just, oh my. But whatever it is, it's not unusual for every one of us to say, ah, I've, got, I've got this nose or I've got these ears or, or my, whatever it is. But our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if we are thankful for who God has made us to be, that starts with our heart. It, hearts, it starts with our personalities, if you will. And it also extends to those things that where we are, who we are. And we need to be able to say, thank you, Lord, 
for allowing me to serve you in this flesh. Now, some of us are so upset over the way we appear, we forget that there are individuals who would give anything in the world to appear like we do. Individuals who can't see would love to see. Individuals who can't hear would love to hear. Individuals who can't walk would love to walk. You see, many times we are not content over things that others would love to possess. And when it comes to our bodies, God has made us in a special way that includes desire, and the Lord's will is that we are to abstain from sexual immorality. And the NIV on verse 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 5 says that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. That's who we are to be. In our world today, in our country, the age of marriage, remember, all-time highs, immorality is also at an all-time high. There is a presumption of immorality among those who are young adults today. It is just presumed that they are living together immorally. That's just the presumption, and God's people, of course, are tempted with that, but we need to withstand that temptation. Living soberly, righteously, and godly domestically is also very, very important. What if one never marries? We still must be equipped to care for ourselves appropriately. With the duties of the home, Titus chapter, chapter 2 talks about young women being homemakers, and 1 Timothy 5 talks about women managing their households, and understanding these verses, I believe, means that the home is a priority for Christian women, but it does not mean that she is the only one to serve in the home in domestic areas. Now, a man or a woman who becomes an adult without knowing how to cook basic meals, keep a house clean, and do their own laundry is ill-prepared for life and for marriage. In many marriages today, it's not who cooks. It's often a question of who gets home first because both work. It's not a question of who does the laundry, it's when is the laundry best done with the priorities that we have in our family. By the way, ladies in our culture usually work two jobs, one outside the home for income, or since COVID, maybe inside the home for income, and they also have all the chores. And many times a man will come in from whatever he's doing, whether he's working at home in the bedroom next door, he comes in and says, oh, I'm tired, I've worked hard today, and sits down. And I've seen men tap on the side of their coffee cup for their wife to get up and fill their cup. A good skillet upside the head would cause that discussion to have a lot more meaning. <laughs> now, gentlemen, if that's what we're doing to our wives, if that's what we're really saying God intends the roles to be, let's stop and think just a minute. Because sometimes we men beat our chest like Tarzan in a movie and we think, I am, I am too much a man to do anything around the house. Jesus himself washed the feet at the table. He himself did that. The job of the lowest servant. Jesus himself, after his resurrection, served breakfast to those who had been fishing. Come and eat breakfast. And they saw their fires of coals and fish on it and bread. They came and Jesus took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. Gentlemen, if we can't handle our own things, what are we going to do if our wife is sick? What are we going to do if our wife is ill and can't make our toast or get our coffee? Are we just going to sit there and starve and complain and whine? I hope not. I hope we learn better than that. I hope we have more skill than that. And I hope we have more love than that because domestic matters are for the family to engage in. Children, husband, and wife. And we can still maintain our roles appropriately, men, and help in these areas. But you have to talk about it. You can't just sit there and tap your coffee cup and it all work out emotionally. Okay. Oh, oh. That, was, that was an emotional moment, wasn't it? Talking about that. God has given us not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That is what we all want. We want that sound mind, the 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. We want to meditate only on those things that are helpful. We want to be able to cast our care upon the Lord, 1 Peter 5 verse 7. We want to say, along with Isaiah 41 verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. But how does God do that? It is not a miraculous thing. It is through blessing us with resources that are available for our use. And so if on this day we have a mishap and we fall and break an arm, we don't say, sit right there, we'll pray for you. 
Yeah, we'll pray for everybody. Of course we will. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Of course we will pray for people. But we'll also say you need to go to the doctor. You need to find an arm doctor. You need to find a broken arm doctor. And you need to do it now. Emotional difficulties in our life is absolutely no different. Whenever we have emotional difficulties, the Lord has blessed us in our culture with doctors that can help and medications that can help. And we would be wise to say thank you, Lord, and to avail ourselves of those blessings rather than just saying, I'll pray for you. It is not a wise thing for someone to go through severe emotional difficulties and have well-meaning brothers and sisters say, well, you just, need, you just need to be stronger. You just need to have more faith. That doesn't help. That doesn't help at all. We who work with people who have issues like these, we need to be the one who say, yes, we have faith. We will pray, and we're also, we're also going to find a doctor for you to talk to. And when you go find that doctor, you tell them you're working with this preacher. And you tell them that I'll be glad to talk to them if they'll be glad to talk to me. And so we can talk about what the scriptures say. And we can talk about what the doctor says. And we can get through this. But if all we do with our part is say, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Just come to church. Sometimes life crumbles around us and we don't know what to do. But there are resources in our nation that are not the same all around the world. Spiritually... The writer of Proverbs, Solomon, said, My son, give attention to my words. Keep your heart with all diligence. And we, of course, know as God's children, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But what if? What if we're... What if we've not... Huh, what if we've made a lot of mistakes? What if we've not made the Lord a priority? Well, the psalmist says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. When we get confused with our values in life, let us never forget to go back to God. Let's go back to the scriptures. With my whole heart I have sought you, David said. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so on and so forth. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget you, your word. Now, why do we get married? Sometimes people say, that's a good question. Why did I get married? Why do we get married? Marriage is the intended consequence of God's gift of desire. And Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where he talks about the gift of desire, and that it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And in this particular passage, Paul is saying, I wish everyone was unmarried and able to control themselves like I am, but there are different gifts involved in this. And regardless of whether the gift is the the ability uh, to control the desire or the degree of desire is not the important part of all of this. The, the important part is simply this, that we are to be very careful to see the gift as something that is to be used appropriately. The gift of desire is to be used as a privilege and not a right. Our culture says the exact opposite. Our culture says if you have sexual desire, you have to exercise that desire. That is not true. Now it is true that Hebrews 13 verse 4 says marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Sometimes people look at this and say, see, I can get married, I can get married. But just because an individual has the gift of desire, and just because that gift may be difficult to control, is not a license to exercise that gift. And sometimes individuals have made mistakes in their life that mean it is not correct, it would be sinful for them to marry again. Some individuals are prohibited from marriage because of previous choices that would make remarriage un, uh, un, unscriptural or sinful. And others are prohibited from marriage because they never have the opportunity. Remember that 4%? Many individuals never have the opportunity to get married. And even with their gift of desire, they have to control themselves morally. Well, why, why do we get married? What's important about getting married? Individuals say it's very important to have love. And that's a reason to get married. To make a lifelong commitment or to have companionship or to have children or to have a relationship recognized in a religious ceremony or for financial stability or for legal rights and benefits. All of these are very important reasons to get married, individuals say. But what if we could prepare for marriage by knowing potential areas of problems? I think that would probably be helpful if we could know that. Well, 
We can, because there's been studies on all of this. This particular study is 30 core disagreements that couples encounter, and you may see this list that I'm about to show and say we could add a bunch to that. That's not the purpose of this. What are the most common things that people fight about? Money, sex, who takes out the trash, who has a wandering eye, whether one or the other person feels unattractive, will we stay together, and so on. And everyone who ever works with a troubled marriage understands that these are huge issues in people's lives. What are the most common things that people fight about? This, this author says, understanding relationship disagreement on a detailed level is critically important due to increasing rates of divorce and infidelity, the potential for relationship dissatisfaction, abuse and domestic violence, and the negative impact on children and society. Given how reluctant people are to marry, getting granular about disagreement and dealing with it before taking the plunge makes marriage a less iffy prospect. If your relationship can't stand the strain of prenuptial exploration, let alone the conflicts which come up around wedding planning, rushing into commitment, unprepared is ill-advised. Okay, there is a scale. Reasons for disagreements in romantic relationship scale. If you want to just throw around an acronym, that's the RDRRS. So people might think you're sounding like a, like a pirate, you know, but it's the RDRRS. Okay, now here they go. Not showing enough love or affection, lack of communication, one not paying enough attention to the other, not being appreciated, feelings, jealousy, talking to an ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend, being possessive, past relationships, whose friends we hang around more, housekeeping, chores, who does more work, not showing up when supposed to, sharing responsibilities, one wants sex, the other doesn't, frequency of sex, sexual acts, telling private information about relationships to others, in-laws, who's boss, who's in control, dominance, what to wear, religion, goals in life, future plans, children, who should pay for something, one uses all of the other's money. All of these 30 things are then into six categories, inadequate attention or affection, jealousy and infidelity, chores and responsibilities, sex, control and dominance, future plans, and money. Now, if we want to prepare for marriage, let's prepare to not have the disagreements that most people have. We can know what these are, and we can figure out. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We are smart enough to drive a car and buy a house. We are, we are smart enough to function in life. We can do this. We do not have to plead ignorance when it comes to relationships. We can learn and we can work. So what's the purpose then of premarital studies? Well, premarital studies are not to make up for years of neglect and teaching on the part of the parents. And they're not to make up for inattention or rebellion on the part of the person getting married. Now there is no record of this happening in the Law of Moses. But Deuteronomy chapter 21 tells parents what to do with a no good kid. Now, some kids are rotten. Some kids are just rotten. Does that mean they have to stay rotten? Not at all. Of course they don't. But individuals who are taught every day of their pampered life that anything they want they can have and anything they want to do they can do and nobody can tell them what to do is headed in Old Testament times for a stoning outside the gate of the city. And here's the way it would work. Now I can just imagine the parents saying to their child, son, come with us. Where are we going? We're going to the gate. What are we doing there? We'll see. You'll see. So here come the parents with this adult child, adult child, adult child, and it's like, what are we doing here? Well, you'll see, you'll see. And right over there is the city gate. We're about to turn the corner. Son, we've asked you to control yourself, to behave yourself. You know what the rules of the house are. You know what God wants you to be. You know what we want you to be. You don't pay a bit of attention to us. You're lazy, you're a drunkard. We're tired of it, and we're not going to put up with it. Right around this corner, at the city gate, when we go there, we're going to tell the men who you are. And they have an obligation to take you outside the gate of the city and throw rocks at you till you die. Now you have a choice, son. We're gonna to walk to the city gate, and you're going to die because we're going to go home, but you're not. Or you can turn around and go back home with us and you can behave yourself. 
Now I suspicion a conversation like that is why we never read of any child having to do this in Old Testament times. Whenever parents have a rotten kid, it doesn't help to make excuses for them. And if our child is stubborn and rebellious, we need to work on that before we try to marry them off and be part of somebody else's home. Understand that when we start saying what my son needs is just a good woman or what my daughter needs is just a good man, that's another way of saying we hope the influence of someone else's godly home can overcome what has happened in ours. Now, there are a few things more difficult than trying to raise an adult to be an adult while being married to them. Now, every one of us can be immature in so many areas. Just talk to Cassie if you have an hour or ten. She could, she could tell you a lot of mine, and I could, I could add more. So, no, I'm not looking at this and saying, oh, all of us in this assembly who are married, we knew exactly who to be and what to do. It's like, oh, my, we, oh, it's just sad. It's just sad. And so we look at ourselves and we say, well, you weren't very prepared yourself. That's right, but I want you to do better, please. Because the Lord does give us all instruction. And when we know about that, we can do something about it, if we will. So the purpose of premarital studies is to review the life choices each has made to see if they are appropriate for Christians and to see if there could be compatibility in the marriage. What are the choices this person has made? Who are they? Who are they? Can or will I truthfully share who I am with you? And can or will you truthfully share who you are with me? If we marry, can our one flesh relationship glorify God? You see, the purpose of premarital studies is never to just give the correct answer to a question in a workbook so the facilitator will smile and nod and move on to the next question. That's not the purpose. Because people can lie through their teeth giving those answers. And the facilitator has no idea whether or not the person's telling the truth. So what I told, tell folks that I've worked with through the years, I don't have an answer key to the workbook I use. Your answers to the questions in the workbook are not for me. I'm not looking for a right answer. You're revealing who you are. You're revealing your heart to the person you have declared you want to spend the rest of your life with and with the person you hope will encourage you to be in heaven. That's the purpose of premarital studies. There can be major and minor differences in those studies, and I believe our job in, in facilitating those studies is to point out where those choices and views and opinions of relationship roles are contrary to the will of God, and even where they're not, to point out differences that appear important in individuals' lives. Just because both have been raised in the church does not mean they have the same knowledge or the same view about any subject or area of life. Even if there are no doctrinal differences, even Romans 14 liberties have two sides that are not always easy to tolerate, let alone reconcile and embrace. The value of premarital studies is like any other Bible study. It has very little value if one, only one, wants to study, but the other is not. Or if one or both sets of parents want the couple to study, but the couple has no interest. Or if the leaders of the congregations involved want the couple to study, but the couple has no interest. Or if the one conducting the study is not well prepared for his subject. If these are the case, then it's a waste of time for everybody involved. So, do premarital studies help couples with their marriage? The Journal of Family Psychology, which has nothing to do with religion whatsoever, says the analysis of a survey of those who had premarital studies show that participation in premarital education is associated with higher levels of marital satisfaction, lower levels of destructive conflicts, and higher levels of interpersonal commitment to spouses. Similarly, premarital education was associated with a 31% decrease in the odds of divorce even after controlling for many characteristics correlated with both divorce and premarital education. Preparation for marriage including premarital studies, is helpful and it is needed among us. Everyone who does what they can in this endeavor is needed. Oh, we need everyone, preacher, congregation leader. We need everyone doing what they can. And what we all do varies greatly in time and materials used. Now, some individuals through the years have what they call the talk. And... So I'm, I'm trying to be so nice. When I say done correctly, that can be helpful. 
All right, one anecdote, just one, one anecdote. I happened to overhear a couple talking about the preacher giving them the talk, and what the preacher wanted them to know was what her dress had to look like if he was going to perform the ceremony. That's it? Yeah, that's it. That's it. That was the talk. Like, all right, we're ready. She's going to get that dress that this preacher approves of. She's going to wear that every day for the rest of her life. That's the talk. Really? That's the best we can do to encourage someone to godly living when they're married? So some have the talk. Now, not everybody just says, hey, if I'm going to do your ceremony, here's what you're going to wear. Not everybody does that. There are a lot of individuals who really work hard to make the talk they have very meaningful and worthwhile. Others go beyond that, have multiple sessions for multiple hours using published materials as a guide. Everything we do that is well thought out and presented to the best of our ability will and can help, and we need to do all of those things. If we who are preachers and leaders are going to get involved, then like Ezra 7 verse 10, we need to prepare ourselves for the task. And any man who's going to help someone get ready for marriage needs to ask himself, is my own home in order before I plunge into helping others plan their married lives? If it's not, please respectfully decline. Is my wife okay with me spending this much time helping others? People who have been involved through the decades of helping individuals prepare for marriage or have, and helping them with troubled relationships understand the gift of time that their wife gives to whoever you're working with. That is a huge sacrifice in one's family and it takes a very special family relationship for the preacher between husband and wife for that to work. If we are going to get involved in this gentlemen we need to prepare our mouths. If we're not prepared to keep our mouths shut when we hear things that nobody else needs to hear we should never start. And if we're one of those individuals that just can't help tell everything we know about everybody we know, we should never ever get involved in troubled marriage situations or marital pre preparation. It's just not appropriate for us to share each other's dirty laundry and stuff like this. Now, I make two exceptions. I tell people, look, what, what we're going to say stays between us and God with two exceptions. Number one, if you have broken the law, Either you turn yourself in or I will. And the other is, if what you, have, what you have done in your life rises to the level, in my opinion, that the congregation's leaders need to be notified of what's going on in your relationship, either you will do that or I will. Now, because congregation leaders have a responsibility to know what's going on in the families within their congregations, and also, we have to report to the law when laws are broken, it's not okay it's not okay for a wife to show up with a black eye and everybody just pretend, yeah, it's the tenth time she's walked into a door. It's not okay. It's not okay for us to ignore the obvious in relationships that are obviously not well. And sometimes we have to be the person who has the courage to do what we should do. We also then need to prepare our knowledge. Read and study appropriate materials. This is the family section in my garage. And most of those books have been read and reread through the decades, and only because I never know anything. Anytime I study something, I have to start over, and I'm afraid I'm going to miss something. And so I, I read and I read and I read, and I'll buy a new book and not hesitate because I think there can be things there. If we're going to get involved, we need to make a plan of what and how we're going to study, and then we need to be careful by saying, well, off the cuff will be fine. Well, it may be better than nothing, but not much better. We need to commit to use the scriptures and their principles more than we use ourselves in illustrations to the engaged couple. It's very tempting in such a study for the facilitator to spend hours telling the engaged couple how wonderful he is and how wonderful his marriage is. Now that may be true, but it's not appropriate if you're trying to prepare somebody how to be married. There are many resources available to learn how to do all of this. Talk to individuals among us who do premarital studies. Talk to individuals who are educated in these areas, and more and more of those are happening. 
Many other resources are readily available. What I'm about to show you very quickly are slides from a search of Amazon for books on premarital studies. Here we go. All of those are books on premarital studies. There are resources available. This last one happens to be the workbook that I've used for decades. Here are the chapter headings. What is marriage? Uniqueness and acceptance in marriage. Love as a basis for marriage. What do you expect from marriage? A vision statement or goals. Fulfilling needs in marriage. Roles, responsibilities, and decision making. In-laws or outlaws. Communication. Conflict. Finances. Sex in marriage. And your spiritual life together. May we so live and prepare that if we marry, we can commit to serving God in a relationship that is characterized by love and respect, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The blending of two lives into one is not guaranteed to be easy, and there's no guarantee of success, but if we will be who we are supposed to be, that will make it as easy for our spouse to be who they are supposed to be. And remember, it's not just husband and wife. It's also Christ and the church that we are to exemplify. Love and respect for life.